You're listening to Natural Resources University. This episode features Deer University, hosted by Dr. Bronson Strickland and Dr. Steve Damaris. Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Okay, welcome back to the Deer University podcast. Uh, I am joined today by Steve Damaris. Hello, Steve. How are you? Good morning, Bronson. It's a great day to be alive and, and be thinking and talking about deer. I uh, saw someone in the hallway today. This is completely unscripted. This is random, but I saw someone in the hallway today that um, maybe is your age or a little older. So pretty young guy <laughs> or gal. And I said, I will not say his or her name. How are you doing today? And they replied, at this age, if I'm upright, I'm doing well. (laughs) (laughs) I'm at work, so all is good. Well, Steve, today, um, in my opinion, we have one of the most controversial topics. And we've talked a lot about a lot of controversial stuff. Um, I thought you were going to say controversial people, but no. No, we don't have to, a controversial person. There's there, there's no controversy on the expert that we have on to talk about this controversial topic. The topic is dog hunting. And, you know, when we get into things like baiting and feeding, there's certainly pros, cons. Uh, some people love it. Some people hate it. I don't know if I've ever confronted a deer hunting, deer management issue that is so black or white you either hate it or you are absolutely 100% engaged in it. You love it. You're all about it and and maybe can't comprehend where all the hate comes from, from, from other people that don't respect, you know, your, your choice of hunt and pursuit. <clears throat> and so to that end, I think I have the, I think we have one of the best people we, we can interview. And that is Dr. Gino D'Angelo of the University of Georgia. Gino, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, guys. So good to be here. Fan of the podcast, longtime listener, first time, I guess, uh, participant. Well, thank you for taking the time. Gino is a professor and he teaches uh, a lot of classes uh, and is a full time researcher, which means 200% of his life is busy. So thank you for carving out a little bit of time. Gino also just finished a lecture. So um, he said he, he may be a little bit hoarse after talking for an hour and spending some time with us, but thank you, Gino. And um, to connect some dots, uh, you know, I was an undergraduate at the University of Georgia, and my advisor was Larry Marshington. And I remember, and Larry Marshington is a big dog hunter, and certainly now rabbit hunter, beagles, etc., but he, he took a very keen interest in the topic of dog hunting for deer back in the day and certainly, I guess, uh, led one of the, the first studies. And that is back when, when putting a, uh, a VHF transmitter on a deer was very, very novel. And I remember him talking about uh, putting collars on deer and then running them with dogs and, and explaining to us that there, there's no way that a deer, or excuse me, there's no way that a dog is going to catch a deer and the deer can evade the dogs and no problem. But what I wanted to talk with you about is some of the research that you've done this, this very similar and, and then maybe build on that to where we talk about deer populations and, and hunting and the environment and maybe <clears throat> what, what can we do to bridge the gap here? so we can better understand everyone's point of view. So if you don't mind, would you start with your Savannah River study and kind of walk us through that and, and generalize your findings? Sure, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning Dr. Marchington, who is 
my mentor in so many ways. Uh, not only do I follow in his footsteps here at the Warnell School of Forestry at, at UGA, but also we run dogs together. You know, I've got a kennel myself of beagles that originated from Larry's stock. And so we really appreciate the sport. And, and Larry goes way back. He was a dog hunter growing up for deer in Florida, then became a fox hunter, and now has transitioned in his older years to, to rabbit hunting with beagles. But we appreciate, as he calls it, the, the hound music. And so when I started our research at Savannah River site in South Carolina, I was working on my master's degree under Dr. Carl Miller. And the Savannah River site's a really unique place uh, on the planet, really. If you look at the map of South Carolina, it is a, a forested oasis. You can really pick it out on a map. There's development, agriculture all around it, but it is primarily forested. And it is managed by the Department of Energy. It was a nuclear bomb plant um, in its earlier years. Today, it processes nuclear waste. So it's a highly sensitive site. But there is a large influx during three shifts of the day of people coming and going from Savannah River site. And deer vehicle collisions were a primary concern of Department of Energy and their partners that work on the site. So even though it's really, a, as we would consider it, a low deer density population, so we're talking about less than 10 deer per square mile, pretty low by most standards. Most leaseholders of hunting leaseholders would prefer to have higher deer densities. But even though deer densities were relatively low on Savannah River site, deer vehicle collisions were common. And if you stood next to one of the primary arteries at Savannah River site and watched shift change, you would understand it's like almost like a freight train going by. So any deer that runs across the road during those times is going to get hit. So their primary concern there was not only managing deer responsibly for, you know, ecosystems and, and deer populations, but also protecting human health and safety. So my work on that project, there was a larger deer project going on. My portion of it was to radio collar deer and study their movements relative to dog hunting and at other seasons um, during birthing, during fawning season, as well as the rut when we know that deer move more and they're more susceptible to deer vehicle collisions. And so our work was to understand how the dog hunts were operating and if we can make recommendations to improve those hunts, especially to reduce deer densities along some of these high traffic road corridors. So to design this research, the first thing I did was go back to Dr. Marchington's work, which was done much earlier. And by the way, some of that work, I have to say, still holds up very, very well in the, in the primary literature. Uh, the innovative techniques, Larry Marchington put the first VHF radio collar on a white-tailed deer, and the studies that followed, including the mapping, sometimes by hand, by the way, not this arc map, you know, all these advanced techniques that we have today. So there was a lot of innovation there. And I went back to that to understand how they conducted their research. And something that was a little bit different was they had animals that were marked and they tended to put dog packs onto those animals that were already marked with radio collars. We were operating in a different system. So we tried to capture deer in hunt compartments that we knew would be targeted. So these hunt compartments on Savannah River site are sometimes 10, 20 square miles, really big areas. And they bring in hundreds of dogs and their handlers and hunters, and they, they intensify the hunting effort in those compartments. And so there, if you, if you travel the roads on Savannah River site, including gravel roads, you'll see these numbers on trees, these metal numbers on trees. And those are stands for these big hunting operations. And so they literally bring hunters in by the bus load and drop them off at those predetermined stands along roads. And then they put dozens of handlers and their hundreds of dogs into these compartments and they run deer. And so some of those dog packs will never interact. Some of those hunters will never interact. Many of the hunters will never even see a deer. But in those big compartments with hundreds of dogs running deer, we hoped that some of them would get on our collared animals, and, and many of them did. And so for our listeners that, that don't understand how dog hunting works, we're talking about scent hounds. So we're talking about everything from your standard beagle, a 13-inch beagle, all the way up to, to you know, walkers and, and other breeds that are, that are longer-legged, and they're following the scent of that animal wherever it goes. So when they strike the scent of a deer, 
those dogs essentially line up in a pack and they're following that scent trail left by the deer's hooves that's interdigital gland in the soil and they're following that specific deer and they're going to stay on that deer wherever that deer goes if the deer goes wildly out of its home range or out of the hunt compartment those dogs are going to follow the scent and they're going to stay on it until either they lose it for instance if the deer runs across a swamp and the dogs can't follow or crosses a river and the dogs can't follow or the hunt's over the dogs are picked up or somebody shoots that deer and it's no different for the rabbits that we hunt deer are just kind of like big rabbits but when we run them those dogs are going to keep trailing them and for anybody that has a hound hounds are very driven and so they're going to follow those deer and if they're not picked up those hounds will follow those deer for days on end and so that's sort of how how a hunt works in terms of our research I lobbied the, the hunt masters, if you will, and said, could we get some people into the hunt at those stations, at those stands with the numbered markers on the trees so that we can do radio telemetry? And I won't bore our listeners because today we use a lot of GPS collars and the information's uploaded to satellites and it's a little bit easier. But back in the 2000s, not that long ago, we would, um, we would listen for the, uh, the radio signal of particular deer and using an antenna and earphones like we're wearing today, we're able to um, identify where the strongest pulse of that radio signal is coming from. And we can take a compass bearing on it. And from multiple locations, we can triangulate the location of the animal. And so I stationed interns throughout the hunt area. And I was out there as well. I wasn't just watching from afar. And we continually triangulated the locations of these deer. And so where those compass bearings of the strongest radio signal cross, we would mark a, um, a location on a map. And so throughout these hunts, as well as before, days before and days after the hunts, we know the locations of these deer every one hour, but during the hunts, we would get their location every 20 minutes. So we have a pretty good map of where these deer are moving. And what we found was that during the hunts, most of our deer were impacted by the hounds. They were trailed by the hounds. And those deer desperately try to stay in their home ranges. And so what's a typical home range? We're talking about in that area of the country, bucks have a home range of about a square mile, say 640 acres, with does about half that, so 200 to 300 acres. Those deer would try to stay in their home ranges as they're being trailed by the hounds. And what we saw was many of them stayed in their home range. How did they do that? Well, they'd backtrack. So, you know, go back on the same trail they ran on, just like you might see a prisoner that escaped from the jail trying to elude hounds. They'd hide in thick cover and stay put until the hounds came upon them. Then they'd jump up and make a big run and hide again. They'd do circuitous movements. So like, you know, dodging, bird dogging, you know, and trying to get, get those hounds off their scent. If the, the trailing intensified and the hounds were really hot on their trail, some of those deer would leave their home ranges. And some of our primary findings were that those deer would run sometimes on average about a mile or so from their home range boundary. So this home range we developed across the course of the fall. We knew where these deer were every day. During the hunt, those deer would leave those core areas and go to new areas we hadn't seen them in before. But what we found was all of those deer that left their home range returned within 24 hours and usually much sooner, sometimes immediately after the hunt ended or within 12 or 13 hours, they were right back in their home range. As soon as the sun started to go down, you see them slinking back to their home range and resuming normal deer duties, breeding, feeding, going on about their business for the rest of the fall. So you never saw an... I'm sorry, you, you never saw an example of the chase displacing permanently a deer. They always returned. Always returned. And even deer that were chased multiple times, so during different hunts, we saw that we were able to observe several deer that were impacted by several hunts. They do the same behavior, move from their home range, and return really quickly. Now, one difference I want to note about this hunt structure is it's not like you know, hunters have a lease and they're going to that lease and hunting those deer with dogs every weekend or every other day. These compartments were hunted maximum two times per year. 
and not every year. So some of these deer may not have had experience with dogs before, and they may not have any experience after this. They had this one experience where they were trailed by scent hounds, obviously probably some stress to them, but they'd still return to what they knew best, which was their home range where they could find resources and, and maintain their social, social interactions with other deer. Gino, what's the, what's the success rate or the kill rate per hunt? Is, is it a lot more effective than stand hunting, less effective? What's your, your feeling on that? My feeling is given this hunt structure, you know, they were looking at maintaining most of these deer populations or slightly reducing them. And so they're looking to remove about a third of the population during these hunts. And that's why they'd return to some of these hunt units if they didn't have enough of a, a kill, if you will. For our deer that we had collared, um, by the way, we only had 13 female deer collar, but given the low deer densities, by the way, of about 10 deer per square mile, that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. We only saw two deer that were harvested during the hunts, so two of 13. Mm -hmm. So most of the deer escaped the hounds and the, and the hunters as well. So Gino, kind of a um, question I'm curious about, and I guess it is relative to the goal of the Savannah River uh, it was population reduction. They they needed a deer harvest to, to reduce the population. Let, let's relate that to, to management. And how selective can, can dog hunters be? So the, the management objective here, I'm assuming, was preferentially to, to harvest does. But in the heat of the moment, and you know, full disclosure here, I've, I've never been on a, a deer dog hunt. Um, so I'm very ignorant of the process, but how selective can hunters be when it's the, the goal is reducing the population? Or can you also, if you're managing for older age bucks, do can you pass younger bucks or generally how does that work? Absolutely. So I should mention that they use buckshot in these hunts for close range shooting and, and you know, to maintain safety so that folks aren't shooting rifles several hundred yards. So it's pretty close up, you know, limited range. And with these stand locations, hunters are pretty dispersed. The handlers are moving throughout the hunt zone. So there is some opportunity for interaction among hunters. And, you know, I haven't dog hunted for deer myself, although I was obviously in the thick of things with these, these actual research opportunities. So I was able to observe deer. And by the way, I was also able to observe feral hogs during the hunts as well. It's kind of funny to see a 250 pound hog go by and little beagles trailing behind. <laughs> but what I observed was, you know, I've, I've been hunting rabbits my whole life with dogs and deer behave very similarly. And sometimes deer come blazing by you. Sometimes they're just moseying along because the dogs are far behind them. Sometimes the dogs are a half mile behind them on their scent and they're just moseying by. And what I saw was every opportunity to be as, a sele as selective as you needed to be. Um, now, the difference between say button bucks and does, I could see that being a little cloudy if, if a deer is running hard, making that distinction. But between antlered bucks and does, no problem. And most of the time with those deer just slinking through, it's no different than, you know, hunting, stand hunting and seeing deer that are doing their normal movements, or even if they're a little more accelerated during the rut. And so there's quite a bit of opportunity there. And talking to Matt Knox, who's a longtime deer biologist, deer project leader in Virginia, he said that some of the dog clubs that they observed in Virginia were the most selective and they were able to practice quality deer management, selecting bucks at a very high level, and they were producing some record class animals in those areas that were primarily dog hunted. So I hope that answers your question. I, you know, I hit a couple points there, but I do want to return to management too, as you were saying, Bronson, what are some of the take homes even beyond just selectivity? Our recommendations for Savannah River site included um, increasing, so I talked about big hunt compartments, 10, 20 square miles. But obviously compartments have edges and often they were bounded by roads. Expand those areas, hunt adjacent compartments, because if those deer leave their home range and they get into the next compartment, they're taken off the table for harvest because hunters aren't over in that adjacent harvest. 
Also, they'd often do a morning or afternoon hunt. So they'd just hunt a compartment a few hours. Again, sometimes only once a year, every couple of years. Extend the duration of those hunts. This stress on deer isn't something that we're concerned about in terms of, you know, their fitness, their survival and reproduction beyond the harvest. It's if they're run a whole day by dogs, and by the way, the dogs probably aren't going to keep up with the same deer all day, it's not going to have any real consequential effects on them. So if we want to increase harvest, keep on these deer in these areas so that we keep them moving and give stand hunters and the handlers that are also able to harvest deer more opportunities to harvest them. So Gino, can, uh, can we generalize for our audience? It's, you said deer respond kind of like rabbits. And so are dogs just a part of the predatory approach that hunters use and they just happen to use dogs to help with their predation of deer and, and deer are responding in a generalized way to predation so is there i know you're big into behaviors uh, can we generalize that dog deer hunting with dogs is just a form of predation that deer deal with I, I think absolutely, and you know, you think about most of these dogs, I mentioned beagles. How many beagles could take down an adult deer? I love beagles, but most <laughs> I don't think they're going to be too successful at that, right? Yeah. And even these larger coonhound varieties uh, or breeds, you know, they're not taking down deer. So what do we have? We have deer that are temporarily displaced. They're experiencing interactions with these surrogate predators. But they don't believe, I, I don't, I'm not trying to get into the head of a deer. I think they're very instinctual. I don't think they have a lot of cognition going on. But I don't think they believe that these animals are likely to take them down. And that's why I think we observe deer that were going on about their business, even though they're being trailed. Or these rabbits that I talk about that come, come hopping by with dogs on their trail. And they're licking their paws like, okay, this predator that I may may have never experienced before. I've hunted areas, you know, rabbit hunted areas that probably haven't been rabbit hunters for decades. And from what I see, rabbits are like, okay, I've got this annoyance right now, but it's not likely something that's going to catch me. It's obviously slow. It's well behind me. And they're barking a lot. I know right where they're at. So these <laughs> scent hounds are barking. it Every time they strike a footprint of this animal, they're howling. So the prey knows where they're at. I won't butcher the quote from Dr. Marchenton. It's something like, um, what is the deer without a predator? It becomes a cow. And it's a terrible misquote, but it's something like that. Like deer have evolved with predators, as we know, for millions of years. And this is just a different form of predation, Steve, as I think you're indicating. A form of predation that most adult deer, I don't think, are too worried about. I have a couple anecdotes I'll throw in about that behavior and, and they're not getting too stressed out generally from the dogs. The first two deer I ever harvested was during muzzleloader season when I was much younger in graduate school at Mississippi State. And the first buck and the first doe were both shot while they were standing still with my muzzleloader. And that's a short range, I mean, that's an old iron sight muzzleloader. And it, it, dogs came up later on, and they didn't fight me for the deer. They just kind of <laughs> looked at me, and then they went off. Uh, so I, I think I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. I, I have my own anecdote very similar. The first deer that I shot in the South when I was a graduate student working on my master's was on public land in Georgia. And I didn't realize I was on a dog hunt, but I was because – these does come along, I shoot the first one with the bow at like 15 yards. They were just going about their business. And here it comes, it was like a lab and, you know, some mutt. Ten minutes later, they were trailing these deer, pushing them along. I didn't know it at the time. I barked at the dogs and they went on about their business. But that just goes to show how unfazed by being trailed uh, deer can be. And uh, related to that, is uh, and my hunts, the two I'm I'm talking about, were on a national wildlife refuge. So there was no dog hunting, and that kind of gets into another area of of discussion on dog 
deer hunting with dogs, and maybe we're not ready to get into that. We'll kind of cover that more towards the end, Bronson. I don't want to jump ahead of your uh, massively cerebral plans for this this discussion. Uh, jump right in, but, man. I mean, if if we say deer are not stressed out by it, I, I think the majority of stress is uh, felt and uh, implemented at, at the hunter level and, and the neighboring uh, neighbors that, that don't want to hunt their deer with dogs. And dogs don't understand a, a land marker. They chase the deer where they go. Yeah, I mean, it's highly controversial, that's for sure. And I think any any of us, I can't speak for you guys, but, you know, when people come on my property or dogs or cats that aren't supposed to be there, it's agitating, right? I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying maybe a sip of coffee on my back deck and, you know, something something that's not supposed to be there comes along. Or even, I don't want to name names, but, you know, the last place that I lived, I had a little property in the country and... Um, the community had a trail that went across everyone's property, but I was able to hunt on my property. And one of my neighbors, you know, he didn't see it quite as an equestrian trail. He saw it as a gator trail, gas powered um, UTV trail and walked his dog off leash. And it was a little bit annoying when I was trying to hunt to have that disturbance. So I will not refute that it's annoying when, you know, there's a disturbance on your property. But, um, you know, I don't want to get too far off on, on Bronson's plan for us today. But on the, the flip side of things, this dog hunting in, in the South in particular has been going on in some form for probably 500 years. And in a lot of communities, it's within the fabric of those communities that those folks identify as dog hunters, many of which are very passionate, very ethical, they believe in their dogs and their, their, their lineages of their dogs. Um, and they choose dogs that, that run deer well, that handle well, that respond to some of our newer technologies like collars that can track dogs, that can send them a tone to tell them they're getting off uh, property. Those wow. collars can also use, be used to shock dogs to tell them to return to their handler. And so... Although it's been 500 years of dog hunting in some form in the South, we've advanced quite a bit. And, you know, there are some opportunities to preserve the tradition um, on a lot of properties, but not every property. So, Steve, I, I noticed you skipped over the shot placement part of your story. So let, let's they, just they were say behaving naturally. you successfully uh, harvested the deer. Both deer dropped where they were st where they were when I shot them. Yes, okay. I'm not going to say that both deer were perfect shots, uh, but both deer dropped right where they were. A good storytelling, man. So and if that's we true, if, if we have these stories, here, here's my silly, very silly story, but sh shows you I'm a human being, and. Um, I think I was in like 10th grade, 9th or 10th grade. May have been cutting class that morning in high school. I, I can't remember. Uh, statute of limitations, I, that's all long past. So Gino, back in the day, um, I mean, I remember when the grunt call came to being. This manufactured grunt call. And buddy, I was the first one there buying one of those. And... Uh, this morning I went and hunted. I had this one little tree stand, you know, like a lot of us back then. There's no climbing stand. I, two by four, you know, and I'm up 10 foot and I made a little saddle in the tree where I could sit. And I'm going to try out this grunt call. And just as luck would have it, I climbed up there, got situated. The sun is coming up and I honked on, on this grunt call <laughs> a couple times. And to my amazement, I, I start hearing running and crashing. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This is revolutionary. Deer are coming. And, and sure enough, and it was a buck. It's probably a two-year-old buck. Comes running by wide open. Of course, I'm not thinking. I'm like, I wonder, you know, if, if the buck was coming to the grunt call, I wonder why he didn't come to the tree and stop and look around. Just 
kept on going 100 miles an hour. And uh, sure enough, Gino, like you were saying, you know, 500 yards away or 1,000 yards away, two two dogs. Now, it wasn't a dog hunt. It was probably feral dogs, but yeah. they ran the deer by. But for like 20 minutes, you, you couldn't have paid me a million dollars for that grunt call. I thought it was just the, the greatest thing in the world. Um, so, Gino, one thing I'm curious is where you, where you were at there with Savannah River. Um, really, really big property. And I think you said there were two or three organized hunts throughout the year. Did I get that so right? So per compartment, they run hunts every Wednesday and Saturday throughout the fall and winter. But yeah, per compartment. So like say you're leased there, maybe where you're cutting class or wherever you might have been. Um, <laughs> imagine it only being hunted once or twice a year. Yeah. And so even those dogs, those feral dogs, they probably run deer most days. They're probably feral most days. And recall, especially in the south, but also well in the north, when we were trying to restore deer populations from extirpation, near extirpation through a lot of, a lot of their range, dogs were a big enemy. And we're not talking about just scent trailing dogs, we're talking about dogs that can bay um, deer in swamps, they can kill dogs actively, they run in big feral packs. Feral dogs were a big problem in the restoration of deer, and so that's why many states have laws that allow hunters to shoot dogs that are running deer, especially unmarked dogs. It depends on the state, but deer can, uh, you know, one of their greatest enemies is dogs. So in the scenario you described, um, all the deer, of course, there were, I think you said two were harvested, but other than those, all the deer that were radio collared, that they, they all returned. What do you think would happen in terms of, and I know you, you teach physiology, physiology, nutrition. What if you're doing that every week? What if in that compartment you had a dog hunt every single week? Do you think at the end of the year there would be a measurable difference in some type of health metric or condition metric for that population if they were hunted like that? over and over and over for six weeks or two months. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's speculation because I don't think we have great data on it. I think that we would probably see elevated stress levels. I'd love to have, you know, some interns out there collecting fecal samples so we get cortisol levels and track that. But I don't know, does it become, become the new normal for those deer? For instance, I hate to always use my rabbit examples, but Dr. Marchington and I, we run some of the same rabbits on the same areas, sometimes just 20 acre blocks, repeatedly throughout the year to keep our dogs in good shape. And the behavior that I observe is rabbits that are unbothered by it. The, some of the same behaviors I talk about, just, you know, behavior often translates to stress levels. These are animals that aren't particularly vigilant during the chase because they know these animals aren't going to catch them. Now, if we scaled it up to large packs of long-legged hounds repeatedly chasing the same deer, that could be a different scenario. But as I understand it, some of the dog leases that we're talking about, some of the so even national forests, we're talking about tens of thousands of square of acres or square miles even. We can be talking about huge compartments. But there are leases in Florida that exceed 50,000 acres where people are dog hunting. Some of the areas that they hunt, they may only hunt it once or twice a year and move on to another part of their lease or national forest. I think where we see deer that, are, that could be highly stressed is where it's long open seasons, no quota, so as many hunters in packs as want as, as want to be on that property per weekend or per week can be there. So no limitations where it's wide open and anybody can hunt anywhere on a property. I would imagine stress levels of deer would be higher. I imagine the deer that are repeatedly chased may not return to their home ranges as quickly or may not even return during the hunting season. I can't say that though because I think what we need to do is a joint study between Mississippi State University and University of Georgia, funded by some grantor that has a lot of money, 
And if we had GPS units on deer, dogs, and hunters, and we collected samples to evaluate stress levels of these animals, I think we can learn a lot more. I think that is a great idea. And uh, just make, make the check out, I guess, to Mississippi State and or UGA. And we'll, we'll get that going ASAP. Well, I mean, it's, it's really it, interesting. That would be a great study. Me. But what I, what I see is, um, you know, from understanding also some of the, we don't have great human dimension social science research on this, but I can see a lot of controversy. And, yeah. and I think that in that area of research as well, understanding these different stakeholders, hunters that use dogs, hunters that don't use dogs, people that have neighboring properties, say public land users that are non-hunters, Understanding how all these groups interact in a dog hunting scenario is really important. And I think we have limited information in that realm as well. Gino, can what, we, what, real, real quick, let me follow up, Steve, with that. But Gino, can, can we generalize to where we know the, the same things happen just with still hunting or stand hunting? I mean, we know that repeatedly hunting deer... I'm not saying with the dog, but yes, just humans being on the landscape with bow and rifle, um, it's going to disturb deer. It's going to alter their behavior to some extent. So th this is really just another form of it. So it may not be that the dog hunt itself is bad. It's just that with any of these forms of hunting, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly doing it without giving the population a time to rest, they're both going to be potentially detrimental. Sure, absolutely. You know, we've seen some great research from many of our co colleagues, but intensive hunts that don't include dogs, for instance, you know, we're, and even think some public parks listeners, you know, public park that's hunted intensively, there's stand sites, every 10 acres there's a stand site, usually occupied by hunters, sometimes with a shotgun, rifle, whatever it may be. Those deer often go nocturnal. So what does that look like? It doesn't mean that they go to the next county. It doesn't mean they go to the next neighborhood next to the park. They, they stay put during the day, and then come sunset, they go on the move and go about their business. After hunting season, they return to more normal patterns, dusk, dawn, some daytime movements. Certainly, we see that. We see avoidance of bait sites. We see avoidance of stand locations. We see avoidance of trails because hunters tend to use trails to get to their stands and create disturbance. And so this is another form. One thing I want to highlight is, is that when you release a pack of, let's say, even 12 hounds in one of these hunt compartments that I'm talking about, or a location on a hunting lease, those dogs just aren't willy-nilly chasing all the deer on that property. They're focusing on the scent of one individual deer, and they may be moving through the home ranges of other deer, but they're not necessarily actively chasing those other deer. And you need another rabbit example, so I'm gonna give it to you. When we're running dogs on these small areas where we train our, our dogs on rabbits, oftentimes I'll let my beagles run sometimes an hour and a half in an area, think 15 acres, like some of these suburban lots that listeners might live on. A small area and that rabbit stays on that area. When I go to pick up my dogs, sometimes I jump deer that are sitting on that small acreage in thick cover and they're undeterred by the dogs. Hey, Gino's back again with this ratty pack of beagles. He's just <laughs> going to run these rabbits and not even bother me. I've seen fawns that have done really well in those areas, maybe getting some protection from predators because we're so active on, on that land. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. I cut you off so, a moment ago. I was well. So, so I guess uh, what we've what you've helped us understand, Gino, and thank you for that, is that behaviorally, under certain circumstances, absolutely no impact on the deer, other than normal predator avoidance. At higher levels, there hasn't been fully researched at higher levels of activity by the dog hunters, there may be some increased stress uh, on the populations. Has there been any studies that just compared uh, large areas that were dog hunted compared to large areas that were not dog hunted in terms of like the reproductive performance, corporal luti accounts of does on, on these large scale, you know, 
impact areas? To my knowledge, Steve, no, I may have missed the literature, but uh, I have not seen those direct comparisons. And I can't even remember any uh, reproductive information, particularly tied to, to dog hunting studies. Okay. Uh, I, I do remember a study in, in East Texas years ago where the dog hunted area had lower deer numbers than the non-dog hunted area. Uh, which the 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 uh, researchers concluded that the dog hunting was maybe more effective at reducing the deer population, which is not a bad thing because from a biologist standpoint, we often say you got too many more, too many deer, you need to harvest more deer. Uh, so right. that in and of itself is not a negative. Uh, so bottom line, it seems like you're saying that there's there's not a lot of known if any, known negative effects of the dog hunting as generally practiced or as practiced under the research conditions. And it seems like the biggest controversial issues tie back to how is it done and how is that way that it's done impacting neighboring properties. So can we talk a little while about, uh, cause we're not going to answer. And even if somebody sends us these big checks, we're not going to have answers mm-hmm. on these other questions for years. So what can the listener that thinks dogs and dog hunters are the, you know, the bane of their existence and uh, what can they do? I mean, I, I know people that have built fences around their properties to keep the dogs out that they were that frustrated what besides a fence what can what can a what would you advise those landowners and hunters that have a problem with dog hunters that nearby what what can they do yeah and you know i i'm never going to refute that it's probably aggravating to people and as i talked about all of us you know want our own kingdom where we enjoy our coffee in the morning whatever it may be but as you mentioned, Steve, dogs are going to do dog things, right? They're going to trail deer wherever the deer goes. They're going to cross property boundaries because they don't necessarily understand them until we help them to understand them through a tone or shock from their collar. And, and listeners, I want, to, I want to just return to that for a second. We're talking about correction collars that can be used on dogs. Some of you might have bark collars for your dog so it doesn't bark at your neighbor that may be annoying, but the dogs just don't like it and, you know, don't like that neighbor and they can't help themselves. So you have a collar that every time that animal barks, it gets shocked. That's not what we're talking about necessarily for these. We're talking about a collar that has to be actively engaged by the dog handler. So they can watch a GPS map of where their hounds are traveling. And if those hounds are about to cross a property boundary or maybe encounter something dangerous like a highway, they can send them a tone and there'll be an audible tone from that dog's collar that says, stop, turn around, return to handler. It's not saying those words, but through training, dogs understand what the tone means. Because when they were puppies, the tone was preceded by a shock if they did something wrong, a light electrical shock. And if they continued to do wrong behavior, they would receive a more intense electrical shock. These are really effective. We rabbit hunters use them so that our dogs won't chase deer because we want them to stay on the proper game that we're looking to chase. And so dogs learn what those tones mean. They are often paired with verbal signals from the handler early in life so the dogs understand how to handle. And when they receive a tone, they know to stop the trail and return to the handler. So we can stop dogs from crossing property boundaries to some degree. Hounds are very stubborn. And there's some limitations for the technology. There's limitations in terms of the dog's training. But a good handler with a good pack that has come up and been trained from puppyhood can really keep themselves on a property. So I want to return to your your primary question, which is what are some recommendations that we have to reduce these conflicts? We were... um, We were funded by U.S. Forest Service several years ago to conduct a study. Uh, Now, this is like 20 years after my original study on dog hunting, but a much different study. And what we did was we conducted a literature review. So we, we looked at prior studies of dog hunting as well as deer movements in general. We conducted a mapping mapping exercise to identify how deer might respond on different properties to dog hunting. 
Could we keep them on a property of different sizes? And we also interviewed state deer biologists to understand some of the conflicts that occur in their states regarding dog hunting. So at the time of our study, there was only nine states in the union that allowed dog hunting. They were all in the southeast. And um, we learned that regulations were in place because of these conflicts to reduce um, interactions between dog hunters and non-dog hunters and the general public. And we found that we needed really large areas to contain dog hunting. But some of the, the specifics were that states found that requiring hunters to register where they're going to hunt, when they're going to hunt, so sometimes it's the state sets a season, or sometimes hunters apply to hunt a certain public ground, for instance, during a certain season. Requiring those hunters to have markings on their dogs, so sometimes they use bleach to put numbers on the side of their dog, sometimes it's a collar, whatever it may be, so that those dogs, if they're caught off property where they're supposed to be hunting, they can be tied back to the hunter. Requiring hunters to have um, indications on their vehicles, that who the hunter is, where they're supposed to, I'm supposed to be in compartment A, for instance. That all allows for accountability and enforcement. And that accountability brings a lot of solace to people that have dogs crossing their property where those dogs weren't intended to be hunted. And so accountability is really important in states. Those regulations that limit seasons, so, you know, instead of having a four-month dog season, maybe there are certain weeks per month that allow hunting. Regulations that require properties to be of a certain size, for instance, in some states, 500 acres or bigger, or public properties that have dog-only seasons versus non-dog hunting seasons. All of these regulations reduce conflicts. I mentioned that we did a mapping exercise. So in the absence of this grand study that I envisioned that we would do marking deer, dogs, hunters, etc., we did this modeling exercise where from the literature we extracted metrics. So what, are, what is a deer home range in the southeast for bucks versus does? When deer are chased by dogs, how far outside of their home range do they go? When there's intense hunting pressure, how does a deer change the configuration of its home range? How does it use those core areas more? So we plug these metrics into this simulation model in a mapping exercise, and we did it specifically for national forests in Mississippi, because U.S. Forest Service in Mississippi asked us to be objective researchers and to evaluate the feasibility of allowing dog hunting on their properties. On these properties, I have to mention there are inholdings. That's where it's not a contiguous block of national forest. Say it's 50,000 acres and much of it's public land national forest, there could be hundreds of inholdings of an acre, five acres, 50 acres that dot that landscape of the national forest. And so those inholdings are where a lot of these conflicts occur or around the boundary of the national forest. So what we did was in this mapping exercise, we put a simulated deer population on the property. And for each deer in that population, well, how many deer do we use? Well, Mississippi State had done some surveys to understand deer densities on these properties. So suppose this property should have 10 deer per square mile. We would apply that in our mapping exercise. And each of those 10 deer, we would draw from a random selection of these metrics. This is a buck. It's been randomly assigned to be a buck. It has a home range of 500 acres and when it um, is pursued by hounds, it's going to leave its home range three quarters of a mile. So we, we pull from all these metrics. It could have been zero to a thousand acre home range, uh, re more reasonable numbers, I should say, like 200 acres to 500 acres, 300 acres to a thousand acres. So we draw from that distribution of metrics and we apply it to the simulated deer population to say, if we apply dog hunting and this animal is pursued by dogs, where will this deer go? And if a deer is along the boundary of the national forest, there's a greater likelihood it's going to travel across the boundary and be on private land. If that deer's home range is centered near an inholding, it's likely to create a conflict and go across an inholding. And so across the broader national forest, we're able to say, given this simulated deer population in this mapping exercise, based on what we know for deer in the southeast and how they move and how they move relative to dogs, 
this is the containment that we can expect for a dog hunt on this property. And lo and behold, larger properties, say 50,000 plus acres, can contain more dog hunting because deer that are more insular to that property aren't going to travel across property boundaries because deer aren't traveling 10 miles when they're, when they're impacted by a dog pack. So what do managers do? They create buffers around the edge of the national forest and they can say there's no dog hunting in this area because we know there's a high likelihood of conflict. These dogs are going to travel across the property boundary. Or in this area of the, the national forest that has more inholdings, we're either going to eliminate dog hunting from that area or we can ask these property owners to have leases or ask the, pub, the, the dog hunters to lease those properties if they want to hunt in those compartments to reduce those conflicts. But you might imagine in your neighborhood, for instance, not everybody agrees. Not everybody's going to be willing to lease their, their land for dog hunting. So that may not be as feasible, but these boundaries set around areas that have a higher likelihood of conflict can reduce the intrusion of dog packs. From our regulation um, interviews, so understanding the state deer biologist perspective, and we also interviewed some other individuals to understand how dog hunting conflicts occur, we recommended that states require the use of some of these newer technologies, these tracking collars and correction collars, so that we could reduce the movement of dogs across boundaries. So those are some of the recommendations that we, we gave the, the U.S. Forest Service, along with education, open communication, and bringing all these stakeholders together as much as you can to try to talk through some of these controversies to reduce conflict. Good info, good info. Um, Steve, I, I know we have a, a hard break coming up here in a few minutes, but uh, I just had a thought relative to, we've been, we've been talking about the Southeast and how uh, at least currently, it seems like dog hunting is pretty much a southeastern thing. But uh, recently, uh, you were in Europe, and I, and I mm -hmm. think you you visited with a lot of red deer, wild boar hunting preserves where they were still using uh, dog hunting. Can you comment on that really quick? Sure. They they have uh, a lot of fenced properties in Europe. It's a highly intensified use because they've been doing it for thousands of years. Uh, and, and they use enclosures and they'll come in and, and literally have a single hunt in, a, in an enclosure each fall to, to do all their population control. And they have estimated numbers of animals. And they, uh, one property that we, we visited, uh, well, uh, I want to say it was about 800 acres. And uh, they had roughly 35 stand locations roughly around the outer boundary near the fence boundaries of the property and hunters would pay for their opportunity to hunt that day and they would all be put out on their various 35 stands and they might have uh three or four different sets of handlers and dogs working this property for just literally a morning or an afternoon so similar to what they were doing uh, at savannah river uh you know and uh, they would harvest get get a lot of harvest done and, and they would uh, the hunters there would would pay differing amounts based on how many they wanted to harvest uh, in term, and whether they were trophies or they were meat hunting and things like that. They had all these different payment schedules. But, yeah, they actually use similar methods in Europe, uh, which does not involve a lot of intensive, regular use of the dog. So back to the point, is, you know, a, a little bit of behavioral modification is no big deal. And it can be an effective harvest tool in those cases. Now, they also had managers that would go back in and do, you know, culling procedures to, you know, if they didn't get enough uh, of a certain type of animal, they could go back in and, and do some supplemental harvesting. But the dog hunting was basically one day, maybe two, two days out of the whole season. I wonder, Gino, if this is just something um, relative to the Southeast, 
this is kind of two ends of the continuum we face with hunting and management as we've got the, the still hunters, the stand hunters, and then the other end is the dog hunting. So very, very different. But what, when we think about it, all our friends and colleagues in the Midwest, maybe there's not dog hunting, but there's deer drives. So you can kind of see that same level of very, very I- intensity and everybody's on the landscape and we're moving deer through and someone's sitting there on their 50 acres, 100 acres, 200 acres, whatever. And some deer run by and you think stinking, you know, deer drives, ruined everything, running deer across my property. You know, um, I, I wonder if it's, it's, if it's just very uh, specific, you know, the part of the country we're in of how the, the stand hunters shake our fists at the people hunting deer differently than us. Sure, yeah, and we bow hunters, you know, we, oh boy, the gun hunters run it, ruin it. No, here's my experience growing up in Pennsylvania. I mean, intensive deer drives, up to 25 people legally can, can do a deer drive. And yeah, it can be annoying, but there are plenty of days sitting in the stands, I, I was wishing, I wish the neighbors would do a drive. <laughs> Just get these deer moving, because it's a little bit boring sitting in this stand. Right. Yeah. Or my experience in Minnesota on public land. And, you know, in Pennsylvania, it was like you kind of avoid it. People that weren't part of your drive, you'd go around them. But people would walk up, we'd have conversation, maybe even share a coffee or whatever. And it was a real social activity, which could enhance um, the hunting experience. And you know what? There's plenty of deer and a lot of deer evade those drives. Um, so these opportunities to, to see kinship with other hunters, even if we're not a dog hunter, we're a stand hunter or a bow hunter versus rifle hunter, we, we're we on the same team. I can certainly see the conflicts, but I don't think the sky is falling when um, dog hunting occurs on a property in terms of the, the production of a deer population, its quality. I can understand the controversy and some of the experience differences but in terms of deer i think they're doing quite well even on on intensively hunted leases well gino how about we wrap up with this and i I think you're the perfect person you're uniquely qualified here you're you're a hunter you're a researcher you're a deer researcher also maybe not a big deer dog hunter but but you're a dog hunter so I, I think you really see all the angles here. So here, here's a scenario, a very common scenario. I own or lease X amount of acres, 50, 200 acres, 500 acres, whatever. I'm a still hunter. I'm a stand hunter. And then once a year, twice a year, how many ever times a year, a neighbor on the periphery, they, they're dog hunting. And I blow my top every single time the you know the rage sets in and and i want to be proactive <laughs> i want to do something what what would be something proactive <clears throat> that land owner or leaseholder could do that would really work on both sides to bridge a gap and come up with an understanding where where hopefully we could have a, a compatible relationship here with our neighbor um what, what advice would you give to that, that landowner? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's important that we talk, and I realize that not everybody gets along, and, and it can be difficult sometimes to approach your neighbors or even to know who they are. But I think we've got all year outside of hunting season to make those connections. And I think well in advance of any anticipated conflict, getting to know our neighbors, who's going to be hunting there, and just understanding each other like okay how are you releasing dogs you know could it be on the other side of the property um understanding where i hunt and when i hunt and maybe adjusting my schedule to even benefit from the dog hunting I, so i think having that discussion is important understanding not everybody can get along but communication goes a long way exchanging phone numbers we all text now right some of you use social media and having that one-to-one conversation instead of this conversation in the uh, across the greater internet or the letter to the editor get to know my neighbor and how we can help each other 
reduce our stress levels during the year. I think that's really important. But beyond that, if, if I was a stand hunter, still hunter, and I had dog hunting adjacent to me, I'd work on having some nice thick bedding cover on my property. I'd reduce my intrusion into the property and so the deer felt comfortable being on my property and finding it when the dogs are released because that could really enhance my hunting experience. And so, you know, there, there are some pluses as well for the neighbors adjacent to, to dog hunting areas. Well, Gino, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. I, I know um, we didn't solve all the problems here. And maybe we raised a lot more questions. And, and who knows, maybe this is the beginning of a research project uh, years down the road. Hopefully so. Uh, but thank you so much. We appreciate you sharing your, your expertise with us. And we will see you in Louisiana in a few yeah, days, I hope. looking forward to it. Eating some crawfish. But, you know, it's been a pleasure to be speaking with you guys today and to be on Deer University. And now I've gone up a few notches with my students around UGA. So I'm on a stable <laughs> podcast. Well, we'll have you back on because we certainly want you uh, up several more notches. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, you're already up on those notches for us, Gino. We'll just help you get the student perception. Thank right. you very much. I could use all I can get. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Bronson, for your, your wonderful leadership in this dear university. You, you drug me along into the 21st century. Kicking and screaming. Yeah. Okay. See you soon. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.